accurate and reliable food safety management system is a definite requirement of businesses to ensure high quality and safe food products in food, feed, and related industries. There is a risk of food contamination in every part of the food supply chain, from farm to fork. Therefore, control measures should be in place, from pre to post harvest, processing, packaging, transporting, storing, and selling of food products. Food safety should always be a top priority. Competitive advantage in the market is achieved if the food producer has a conscious adherence to the global standards in quality assurance, especially on food safety. Glenwood is committed to help companies establish top-class food safety management system with technologies that are fully supported and approved by reputable institutions worldwide. Since its establishment in 1995, Glenwood Technologies International has been the leader in the exclusive distribution of premium rapid diagnostics and hygiene monitoring kits from trusted manufacturers worldwide, providing quality and technologically advanced products to meet the emerging needs for food and feed safety diagnostics, trusted by the country's largest companies and government institutions. Known as the pioneer in marketing rapid test kits, Glenwood continues to develop its product lines to provide reliable and immediate results in support of its clientele's aim to be globally competitive through conformance with the respective industries existing local and international standards and regulations. Glenwood's core group of technical and marketing staff consists of top microbiologists, food technologists, chemists, and allied professionals in the food and agricultural fields. Combined with broad industry and regional expertise, Glenwood provides the competitive advantage necessary to deliver world-class excellence and best quality products at optimum service. True to its mission to uplift the food safety culture in the country, Glenwood took the initiative to publish the very first magazine on food safety and quality awareness from farm to fork. The Food Safety Trends Philippines magazine is regarded as the reference material of thousands of food safety professionals and students all over the Philippines. Glenwood helps to ensure that food safety is maintained in all parts of the supply chain, from farm to fork. With its superior products and optimum services, we help ensure that every food served to every Filipino is safe for consumption.
Mic test, mic test. Mic test. Okay. From the start. Okay. Hello and welcome, fellow food safety ambassadors. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Sylvester Naputo, and I'll be your moderator for today's technical webinar on water quality awareness. So just some, just some reminders before we get started. The webinar is scheduled to end at 11.30 a.m. and will feature an open forum for the two resource speakers. If you have any questions to our speakers, please type them into the comment section. I'll bring the questions up during the open forum. Participants who will send questions will have a chance to get a mug and free copies of the Food Safety Trends PH magazine, the first magazine on food safety and quality awareness in the Philippines. The speaker's PPD presentations are properties of Glanwu Technologies and the DOH Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, and they will not be shared with the participants. You could still, however, send an email directly to our speakers if you have any clarifications or questions. As a requirement for the electronic certificate of participation, attendees must completely fill out the feedback form. The link will be provided in the comment section after the webinar. The electronic certificate of participation will be sent to the attendee's registered email address a month after the session. So now without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker. Mr. Rosalito Diego de Dios is the Chief Health Program Officer of the Environmental Related Disease Office of the Department of Health, Disease Prevention and Control Bureau. He received his bachelor's degrees in civil engineering and sanitary engineering from National University. In 1992, Mr. Riego de Dios acquired his master's degree in public health from the University of the Philippines. He has been involved in the WHO, Australian Aid Water Quality Partnership for Health, and more relevantly, has been one of the many to publish the revised Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water in 2017. Let us all welcome Mr. Rosalito Riego de Dios. Uh, Mr. Dito, you are muted. Okay, thank you very much, Shibes. Magandang umaga. So, good morning to everyone. Uh, first thing, you know, we'd like to, uh, on, the, on the part of the Department of Health, we would like to thank uh, Glenwood Technologies for inviting us to be part of this uh, uh, technical webinar on water quality awareness. So, this morning, I'll be presenting to you the, the 2017 Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. So may I share my presentation? Okay. So again, uh, my topic is all about the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water of 2017. This was issued by the Department of Health uh, through an administrative order number 2017-0010 uh, uh, on June 23 of 2017. So actually, um, uh, this 2017 Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water is the revised version of the 2007 PNCW. Okay, so uh, okay, so this will be the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'll be presenting to you the objectives of the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. Uh, its scope and coverage, the general guidelines, its specific requirements or general specific guidelines, the roles and responsibilities of those concerned no, uh, that will be uh, that we are expecting to implement or enforce the, the requirements of this uh, regulation. Uh, and the last is all about the, uh, the, the penal provision. So what's the objective of the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water? So its objective is to prescribe these standards and procedures on drinking water quality to protect public and consumers health. So specifically, you know, so uh, these Philippine National Standards uh, for drinking water will um, it aims you not know, to provide to provide us the the standards you no know, for standard parameters and values for drinking water quality as well as the prescribed standard methods for 
for uh, collection, handling, and examination of uh, drinking water samples as well as some relevant uh, policies and uh, and regulations of the Department of Health with regards to uh, uh, drinking water safety. So that's the objective of this Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. As to the scope and coverage of the Philippines, who should comply with the requirements of this regulation? So uh, the PNCW, uh, sorry, the, uh, the 2017 and 2016, no? the 2017 Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water is applicable to all drinking water service providers. So basically, uh, it's the main, you know, the, the 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 main target of this uh, regulation is the drinking uh, are the drinking water service providers uh, either coming from the government or private uh, service providers uh, like uh, bulk water supplier, drinking water uh, bulk water suppliers, water refilling stations, water vending machine operators, even ice manufacturers. All sub, even all establishments, uh, all owners or operators of establishments and institutions no, that supply or serve drinking water, like food establishments, hotels, restaurants, no, drinking water testing laboratories, health and sanitation authorities, and of course the general publics, the general public rather. So, so all of these, no, uh, all of these are required not to, to. Uh, uh, to follow or to observe no, the requirements of the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. So what's the, what's the general requirement of the, the regulation? So as part of the general guidelines, no, uh, the standards for drinking water quality, water sampling and examination and evaluation of results shall conform to the criteria prescribed under this uh, additive order in its manual of operations. Uh, just uh, this year, no, we were able to print no, the, 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 the manual of operations which provide no, a more detailed procedures uh, and requirements to, to operationalize the, the, the requirements of the 2017 uh, Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. Then uh, another uh, requirement as part of the general, uh, general guidelines to ensure that the safety of drinking water the standards, no, the, these standards shall be applied in accordance with the, to the new improved framework for drinking water safety, comprising of three com three components. And what are the key components? No, uh, the health setting of health based targets based uh, by uh, by the health authority, which is actually the Department of Health, based on health concerns, the availability of a uh, reliable uh, and adequate. Uh, safely managed water supply systems, or simply uh, the service the water service providers are implementing water safety plan and a systems of independent surveillance uh, to determine if the water safety plan are really being implemented uh, for the service providers to meet the health based targets based on the uh, Philippine standards for drinking water. So these are the general requirements. No as we uh, implement the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. As to, uh, so this is the improved framework, as I, as I had mentioned. It has three components, setting health-based targets by the health authority, the availability of a, uh, uh, an adequate uh, water supply systems, which implementing water safety plans and an independent surveillance to determine if the water safety plans are being implemented uh, in, uh, to meet the health-based targets. Okay, specific objectives, you know, specific guide, uh, requirements. Uh, uh, first, we start with the uh, standards for drinking water quality. As, uh, with, uh, based on the PNCW 2017, we define drinking water uh, as, as it must be clear and does not have objectionable taste, odor, and color. It doesn't mean that so the drinking water uh, should be tasteless, odorless, and color. You should, uh, based on this, no, we define drinking water as it does not have objectionable taste, other and color, and and to determine no if there's uh, uh, to be more specific no uh, to to qualify the that uh, it doesn't have objectionable taste other and color, so the drinking water must be pleasant to drink and free from all harmful organisms, chemical substances, and radionuclides in amounts which could constitute a hazard to the health of the consumer. Again. Uh, these types of impurities we don't doesn't mean that uh, we do not mean that um, 
it doesn't have those kinds of organisms, but it must it, it might contain those organisms, but that it should it should it should not constitute a hazard to public health. Then the quality of drinking water should be measured, no, to determine the what's causing the the the, the taste, the odor, the uh, the the clearness of the water. So the quality of drinking water should be measured in terms of its microbiological, physical, chemical, and radiological constituents. And then uh, the parameters of drinking water quality shall be classified as mandatory, primary, and secondary. Considering that um, there's, a, there's a, a number of uh, uh, possible elements of drinking water in the forms of microbiological, physical, chemical, and radiological, so we know for a fact that we were not able to monitor or to test all those parameters or those constituents in water. So we have to prioritize and based on this, no, we classify those parameters as the mandatory, primary, and secondary. Okay, so as to mo go more deeper in terms of the requirements uh, in relation to microbiological quality of drinking water, when we mean microbiological quality of drinking water, um, the drinking water, the drinking water must not be contaminated with fe with fecal matter. Why? Because the, fe the fecal matter contains various types of disease-causing microorganisms in the forms of micro, uh, the forms of bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and helminths. So the question is: Are we going to test those those uh, specific types of microbes? Uh, no, no. So for us to describe no, the, the microbiological quality of drinking water, we, we, identif we identify you know, a group of microorganisms that will tell us the water contains uh, fecal matter. Or it, uh, so meaning we have, to, we, we have to come up with an indicator parameter to, to describe or to tell us that it, if it, this, these organisms are present in drinking water, it means the water is unsafe in terms of microbiological uh, qualities. And what are those parameters? No? So the parameters that we use to describe the microbiological quality of drinking water are the following. The total coliform and the thermotolerant coliform E. coli, which, uh, which will tell us that if present in drinking water, uh, it means that the water contains fecal matter. Uh, first thing that the total coliform is, uh, is uh, actually is uh, it could be non-fecal and it could be fecal. Uh, so with that limitation, we have to identify a more specific uh, form of total coliform that is present in drinking water. It will tell us that it really contains fecal matter. And what is that uh, uh, specific total coliform organism? That is thermotolerant coliform or E. coli. So this is uh, uh, actually the E. coli is the uh, is our uh, standard parameter for to, for microbiological quality of drinking water. And then another another parameter to to describe the microbiological quality is the heterotropic plate count bacteria. HPC actually is uh, is, is could be it, uh, it if it's present in drinking water uh, uh, and uh, the the. Uh, an individual can, cannot get disease no, or uh, diarrhea if, it con if, the drinking, if it's drinking water contains heterotropic plate count bacteria. But then heterotropic plate count bacteria is, is, uh, is very important no, uh, to describe the microbiological quality of drinking water because it will normally it is present in drinking water, it will cause taste and other problem. So it's very important that we have to test the water. Uh, and, uh, in terms of the presence of heterotropic plate count bacteria. So these are the three parameters no, to, that we use to, to describe the microbiological quality of drinking water. Okay, so in terms of standard, stand, standard values, no, uh, standard values for these uh, uh, parameters no, uh, in relation to microbiological quality of drinking water, for total coliform, uh, the standard values is simply either the presence or absence of the, the absence of total coliform in drinking water. So uh, when we see, when we, there are three standard methods so for determination of total coliform. These are multiple tube fermentation technique, the enzyme substrate test, and the membrane filter technique. But basically, uh, the standard value, regardless of this, uh, regardless of, uh, regardless of this uh, standard methods, no, uh, the standard value is, is uh, actually 
just merely absence of total coliforms. So any samples collected from consumer stops, no? water refilling station, water bending machines, mobile treatment devices, uh, the point of use uh, treatment devices, uh, a, um, a pump, a, a pump, so, uh, point source, no, uh, point source, no, and anything, no, any, any uh, um, samples collected from these uh, different points, no, of of drinking water, uh, they they are uh, the standard values for total coliform is zero or or, or absence rather, it should be negative. So in terms of e uh, thermotolerant coliform or E. coli. Uh, again, the, the standard value for uh, for samples collected from again for, from these different points, no, uh, of water of water sampling. So the standard value for E. coli it should be negative for E. coli. So I'd like to correct first, no, that I have mentioned earlier that the, for total coliform uh, samples collected from a point source, no, a water point source. Uh, uh, total coliform is actually not a requirement, but then the the requirements that the, the, the value for E. coli, it should be negative, no? So this, uh, again, the last column, the point of compliance, these are the, the points where the samples will, uh, will, uh, will be collected. So uh, the results of the examination in relation to E. coli should be negative. Okay, so in terms of heterotopic paid count, the standard value is the, uh, it should be less than 500 colony forming unit per ml. So these are, again, the last column, these are the, the point, no, the point of compliance where the samples uh, will be collected, and all samples collected from this point of compliance will be uh, less than 500 colony forming unit per ml. Okay, moving forward uh, as to the physical and chemical quality of drinking water. So to describe the the, <clears throat> the quality, uh, the physical and chemical quality of drinking water. We have categorized uh, the different types of chemicals and physical impurities in drinking water as to uh, inorganic and organic uh, uh, chemical parameters with health significance, either coming from domestic activities, from industrial pollution, or from agricultural activities like uh, pesticides. And then there's a certain group of uh, physical and chemical impurities in drinking water that is present in drinking water will affect the acceptability aspects of drinking water, meaning the water will not be uh, acceptable or will not be, uh, that people will be able to drink the water because of uh, there's a physical changes in, in, or in the drinking water quality. But it, it, will, it, it, doesn't, affect, uh, it doesn't affect health uh, if, if somebody drink the water. And then of course we set uh, standard values and parameters for those treatment chemicals used in the treatment as well as uh, for disinfection and disinfection by products of drinking water. So these are the different groups of uh, physical and chemical parameters that uh, uh, to describe the, the physical and chemical quality of drinking water. So as to the specific parameters, these uh, you can see in the table that these are the these are the summary of standard values for inorganic chemical parameters for drinking water. These are the, the maximum acceptable level. All values above this maximum acceptable level um, uh, present in drinking water uh, will cause you know, uh, adverse impact to human health. <laughs> so most of these uh, most of these parameters are. Are, are toxic and should not be present in drinking water above the maximum acceptable level. So this one are the, the summary of standard values for organic chemical parameters uh, coming from industrial pollution of drinking water. Okay, so this include benzene, uh, benzopyrene, carbon tetrachloride, and, and others. Then the, for, the, for the standard values for organic chemical uh, com, uh, coming from uh, agricultural activities, no? we have about 11 of them, uh, which includes aldrin and uh, chlordane. So actually, uh, most of these are, are part of the persistent organic pollutants, which actually uh, banned in, in the country. And then in terms of the standard values and parameters for physical and chemical uh, parameters for acceptability aspects of drinking water. As I said earlier, if this uh, <coughs> if these impurities are present in drinking water, 
uh, even at the maximum, even beyond the acceptable level, these uh, uh, these are uh, uh, the water is still drinkable. But then people will people will not drink the water because uh, it uh, this from this impurities will uh, will uh, cause you no know, changes in the physical appearance of drinking water. Okay, so either it may cause taste, odor, or color uh, in the drinking water, or might create you no know, or might uh, uh, lead to uh, presence of uh, particulates no, or, or, or sediments. So uh, to the standard values for treatment chemicals used in treatment and disinfection and disinfection by product for drinking water. Actually, the new here is, the, is that as part of the uh, approved, no, approved disinfectant for, for drinking water, so before the only approved water disinfectant for drinking water is chlorine, you know. But this time we we, we uh, uh, part of the PNCW twenty seventeen, we add no chlorine dioxide as one of the uh, uh, approved you know, uh, chemical for uh, uh, drink uh, for water disinfection. Okay, as to the radiological quality of drinking water. So these are the the different standard values and uh, standard values, no. For uh, actually, uh, uh, there are three stand, uh, stand, uh, standard parameters that we use: the gross alpha, gross beta, and and rad and and radon. So these are the values are the are only screening level, meaning uh, if if these values have been exceeded. So uh, the next step is that you, we have to conduct a more specific, more specific test you know, to determine the specific type of radionuclides in drinking water. So this, uh, uh, this standard, uh, these parameters and standard values actually uh, uh, were recommended by the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. Okay. So based on those standard values for drinking water quality, you know, as to microbiological, physical, chemical, and radiological, actually there are about eight, 80 of them, you no, know, 80 parameters to describe the drinking water quality. And as I said earlier, uh, the 80 parameters, you no, know, it's, it's very impossible for us to, to test all, all of them uh, all at the same time. So um, to prioritize the different types of uh, parameters you know, of uh, different types of impurities that might be present in drinking water, we classify them into as to mandatory, uh, primary, and secondary. What do we mean by mandatory parameters? Mandatory parameters are, are uh, the least of minimum parameters you know, required to be tested for initial and periodic examinations. It is legally enforceable for all drinking water service providers, meaning as the term is it's, uh, said mandatory, it is mandatory you know, for compliance by all drinking water service providers before they can start to, to serve their water to the public and then, and, and then uh, as they continue to provide the service, you know, the, uh, the water should be uh, tested periodically based on the standard frequency uh, set under these Philippine national standards for drinking water. Uh, the frequency of testing for mandatory parameters, except for E. coli or thermotolerant coliform and residual disinfectant, may be reduced for every three years if the local drinking water quality monitoring committee found the consolidated water quality reports showed undetectable levels below, uh, undetectable levels of a particular mandatory parameter for three consecutive years. What does it mean? It means that if the uh, if the standard the standard frequency uh, for physical and chemical examinations uh, should be done once a year, so this once a year could be could be lesser or less frequent uh, as uh, and it can be uh, as, as as determined no? as determined by the local drinking water quality monitoring committee. Uh, if they found no this uh, these types of uh, uh, contaminants are not present in their area, okay? So the frequency uh, must be less, uh, uh, rather, ra rather than it should be done on a, uh, uh, an annual basis. So possibly it could be done uh, at least once or only every three years. Okay, so what are those mandatory uh, parameters? No? As I said, there are, uh, there, are 10, there are 10 parameters under these mandatory, uh, mandatory parameters. 
uh, for microbiological, it should be the E. coli. Uh, the, for chemical, uh, it includes uh, arsenic, cadmium, lead, nitrate. And then for, for physical, color, turbidity, pH, total dissolved solids. And of course, the last is the disinfectant residual. So these are the, the 10 no, parameters under the mandatory, uh, uh, mandatory drinking water quality parameters. So these mandatory parameters should be done for during the initial as well as periodic examination. Okay, so for primary parameters, primary parameters are site specific, meaning it should be uh, case to case, you know, depending on the, depending, depends on the every LGU. So it's site specific, which refers to those chemical impurities in water that directly affect health through acute or chronic exposure. So basically, the primary parameters are all chemical parameters, no? that uh, all chemical parameters that be present in drinking water might uh, affect human health through acute or chronic exposure. So primary parameters can also be adopted as enforceable parameters or meaning in addition to the 10 mandatory parameters, <coughs> sorry, as identified by the local drinking water quality monitoring committee or by the local government units, okay? Uh, so what are uh, what are those no uh, parameters that will be part of the primary parameters no? So there are about fifty six of them, no. Uh, the, uh, that will be part of the primary parameters. So, um, and most of these parameters are uh, chem chemical uh, elements, and if present in drinking water, it might uh, cause no adverse health impact to human health either by, by chronic or or acute exposure. So for secondary parameters, uh, secondary parameters are also site specific, but then these parameters no, uh, are, <clears throat> are, are, are present in drinking water, uh, may render the water unacceptable for drinking. So, so these uh, parameters no, or these secondary parameters can be used no, as, as uh, an operational parameters no, which affect the efficiency of the treatment process, meaning that these parameters can be used as a uh, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a parameter for, uh, to monitor the efficiency of the, the treatment process of the, of the drinking water service providers. So that's how, <laughs> sorry. So that's how we classify you know, the different parameters you know, of drinking water quality uh, for us to prioritize you know, and we'll be able to, to monitor properly the, the drinking water quality in the country. Okay, so these are the, the, the parameters under the secondary group. So there are about 11 of them. Okay, so uh, to continue, when we're done with these uh, specific uh, requirements for drinking water quality as to the standard values and parameters. Now, in terms of standards for water sampling and examination, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, initial examination uh, and periodic examination shall be required to all drinking water service providers. So initial examination shall be conducted for new or newly constructed, while periodic examination shall be done <coughs> for all existing water sources. So again, what parameters to be examined? So definitely parameters to be examined are those belong to the mandatory parameters, as well as additional parameters that may be required by the local government units. Okay, so as to the number of samples to be collected and examined periodically, it should be based on the, the type of source as well as the mode of distribution of so drinking water supply. When you say type of source, it could be a point source, a communal, uh, communal system, or a, uh, a water work system. And then in terms of the mode of distribution, this includes uh, a water refilling station, bending machines, mobile tanks, and bark water supply. So, so there's specific requirements no, as, to the, uh, as to the number of samples to be collected as well as the frequency of sampling uh, for this uh, mode of dis modes of distribution of drinking water supply. Okay, standards uh, to, uh, to continue no, in terms of standards for drinking water for water refilling station. For, uh, for water refilling station, um, uh, we the standard values for uh, if you remember uh, part of the mandatory parameters are pH and uh, total dissolved solids, but then for water refilling station using a reverse osmosis or distillation process, uh, the standard values no uh, from 
from the uh, watery filling station that using that are using reverse osmosis and distillation process, the pH value, uh, the pH value requirement uh, should be between five to seven, uh, from six point five to eight point five. While the total dissolved solid levels of product water should not exceed ten milligram per liter from six hundred. But then this this value should be used no to validate the efficiency of their treatment process. Is that being used to 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 uh, to determine no uh, uh, to determine the the acceptability of the of the product water if it's drinkable or not? But then is this value are being used? To determine <clears throat> if the treatment process, the reverse osmosis or distillation process, are working properly. Okay. So uh, as to again, just to show you the minimum frequency of sampling for microbiological parameters uh, for um, uh, for level one systems. So when we say level one, this is a point source. Level two is a communal point, a communal system, and level three is the water work system. No? For each type of source, no, they have different frequency. For level one system, the required frequency for microbiological is just one sample for every three months, while level two is one sample for every other month, and level three is uh, two samples per month. And um, uh, depending on the number of population, there will be uh, uh, additional number of samples to be collected depend depending on the, the number of population served. Okay. So uh, for uh, all buildings, no, all buildings uh, uh, that being used for residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional, so are also now governed by this PNCW and and samples to be collected for all these buildings, no, at least one sample every other month. And uh, in terms of uh, determining determining total coliform E. coli, and for HPC, it will be done one sample every other month. And then similarly for food establishments, uh, samples uh, samples have been collected for microbiological examination uh, every other month no? uh, for total coliform E. coli as well as for HPC. Well, for ice plants will be done once a month, uh, both uh, for total coliform E. coli and uh, HPC, and then for water refilling station. Uh, should be done. Uh, each total coliform E. coli test will be done once uh, once a month, see, uh, as well as for HP, uh, uh, HPC test. Okay. So um, so just to again, this is just a, uh, for, for 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 mandatory physical and chemical parameters. So basic requirements here is that samples to be done once a year, except for except for water refilling station we're in. Uh, the, the mandatory physical and chemical parameters should be done uh, at least once, uh, twice a year, no, every six months. Okay. So again, just to show you no, uh, the requirements for water refilling station uh, in terms of the microbiological and physical and chemical uh, parameters, examination, total coliform, E. coli, heterotropic plate count should be done every month, one sample per month, and then for mandatory phys uh, physical chemical parameters, every six months. Okay, for radiological uh, parameters, no? <coughs> initial, initial examinations have been done um, within, uh, for one year, four consecutive quarters for one year, and per periodic examinations will be done once every three years. Okay, standard value, standards for water sampling examination, sorry, oops. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, hello. Ah. Hello. Uh, yes, yes, sir, Lito. I had a problem. Okay. Nawala yung, sorry. Can you see me? Okay. 
Okay. So, to con sorry for that. Uh, to continue, in, in terms of the standards for water sampling and examination, um, only certified sampling personnel that collect water samples for regulatory purposes. And then in terms of the standard methods that, uh, that we uh, use no, for, for this Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water, we adopted the 22nd uh, edition of the standard methods for the examinations of water and wastewater. So meaning that <clears throat> All those 80 parameters is to be it will be examined uh, based on the standard methods, no, as listed in the 22nd edition of the standard methods for examinations of water and wastewater. Okay, but then in terms of the standard methods for uh, radiological uh, quality, it should be done based on the standard methods set by the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. Okay, so those are the requirements for standard values and para, uh, standard, uh, standard values and parameters as well as st standard methods for detection for drinking water. So other requirements as, uh, as part of the specific guidelines of the PNCW. So we reiterated you know, the, the requirements for water safety plan and uh, uh, for all drinking water service providers. So based on DOH Administrative Order number 2014-0027, the National Policy on Water Safety Plan for All Drinking Water Service Providers issued by the Department of Health in September 4, 2014. The, uh, all, all drinking water service providers you know, are required to develop and implement the water safety plan uh, to, um, to, to ensure that the, the, the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water uh, uh, will be complied. So this water safety plan will be subject for review and approval by the Department of Health based on AO 2017-006 uh, by the Department of Health. Okay, as to the roles and responsibilities no, uh, for the Department of Health, the Department of Health is in charge to develop systems and procedures. So we're, actually we're done, no? we were able to, to uh, develop and print the man manual, of manual of operations for this uh, Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. Ensure compliance of all drinking water service providers and operators. Uh, perform independent surveillance. Provide technical assistance to the local government units and uh, drinking water service providers and the, the general public, as well as accredited water laboratories, certified trainings, and, uh, and water sampling personnel. As to the local government units being the, the, the lead implement, in, uh, implementing or the one who will execute this uh, regulation, they should enforce the provisions of this order, develop and implement drinking water quality surveillance, establish a local drinking water quality monitoring committee, advocate and create awareness to the general populations on the importance of drinking water quality standards, impact of water contamination on health and control measures in addressing water quality issues and, and problems. As to the water laboratory, uh, they should comply with the provisions of this order. Uh, first thing is that they have to follow the standard standard methods of detections. But first thing, they have to be accredited uh, from the Department of Health. And then they have to implement quality, uh, uh, QS and develop a manual of operation describing the laboratory's policies and plans for ensuring the quality of the work provided to the public. And lastly, you know, for drinking water service providers or operators of establishments and buildings, they should comply with the provisions of this order, develop and implement water safety plan, particularly the water service providers, institute corrective actions for any unsatisfactory results of water sampling, submit to the accredited laboratories water samples for examination in a manner and at such intervals prescribed under this order, submit results of water quality testing to the local health authority, and educate consumers on how to, how to keep drinking water safe at all times. So these are the responsibilities of the drinking water service providers. And then, so, so this in, uh, Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water is based on the mandate set under the, the, the Code and Sanitation. So if there's a uh, violations of this uh, administrative order, so the penalty provisions of the Code and Sanitation uh, shall be imposed. And what are the penalty provision? So any person who shall violate, disobey, or refuse, no, uh, this order shall be guilty of misdemeanor or upon conviction shall be punished by imprisonment or a period of not exceeding six months or a fine by, by of not exceeding 1,000 pesos. 
So the penalty is quite low because it's an old law, but uh, nonetheless, no, uh, the 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 local government units or even the Department of Health has the authority uh, to close the establishments just in case that they have they have the, the operators have violated the provisions of this administrative order. Okay, so I think that's the end uh, of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lito, for that very informative talk on the 2017 Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. So uh, we will go ahead and take some time for questions now for Mr. Lito. Uh, just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the comment section. Okay, Mr. Lito, let's start with a question from uh, Chirima Godlu. So the question is, uh, this is a two-part question. So the first question is, the what's the difference between chlorine residue and chlorine dioxide? Okay. Um, two different types of uh, disinfectant. So there's a specific residual for chlorine. If you're going to use chlorine dioxide as well as for, for chlorine. So that's, that's the reason why we... Uh, we set to uh, they have different value, you know, for, for for chlorine residual as well as for chlorine dioxide residual. Uh, why we why we we uh, add this uh, as part of the PNCW is because of there's a lot of water districts right now that are using chlorine dioxide as their uh, uh, water disinfectant. The good thing with chlorine dioxide it, it doesn't produce uh, odor. Unlike for chlorine, no, uh, that's the the uh, that's the the main problem with with chlorine. Although it's chlorine is a very effective de water disinfectant. Okay, so the follow follow up question uh, to that uh, question, uh, we are using chlorine granules to disinfect our water using the chlorinator, and we monitor it by using a test kit. Our limit is 0.5 to one ppm for chlorine residue. Is this correct? Uh, the, the the standard the standard value should range from zero 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 point five to one. I think it's one point five. Uh, yeah, I think so. It's up to one point five. But then, uh, but then what we are recommending should be uh, uh, in actual practice the uh, the range should be from zero point five uh, to no zero point. Sorry for that. Zero point three to one point to one point five. But what they the the the, the, the the, the the most appropriate is from zero point three to to one, because uh, if it reach one point five, uh, there will be a problem of taste and taste and odor. Uh, so that's the point five. No point uh, zero point five is being required during emergency situation. But the the service provider must maintain their their uh, chlorine residual uh, 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 around zero point five. But for regular uh, regular times, no, the range should be a zero point three to to one to one, but only the maximum is one point five. Okay, uh, we're hoping that you took note of that. So one point five is the standard. So another question, Mr. Lito, is from uh, Lyra Pretzel Atienza. So she asks, why are manganese and iron no longer part of the mandatory parameters? Okay, well. Uh, they are not part of the mandatory parameters in as much as that. Um, again, uh, those pa those parameters you know, are part of the secondary meaning. Uh, uh, those are part of uh, those physical and chemical uh, impurities in drinking water that uh, affect the, uh, the acceptability of water. No, so um, that will create taste, color, and other problems. So, and, uh, so meaning, uh, uh, and part of the mandatory parameter is color odor. So, meaning if, if there's an excessive amount of uh, iron or, or, or manganese, you no, know, it will create um, uh, physical change in the water. It will, it will create that will uh, make the water unacceptable and uh, the, 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 the 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 acceptable level for color odor or taste will be exceeded. So, so that's the reason why we we didn't include no uh, iron and manganese as part of the mandatory parameters. Okay, so thank you for that uh, answer, Mr. Lito. So the ne the next question is um, this: Why is HPC measured per ml of water sample, 
whereas the other microbiological indicators are measured per 100 ml. Okay. Well, um, well, I think I'm uh, sorry about that. No, I I, uh, I cannot answer that specifically. But then, uh, as I remember, the for HBC, the the uh, unit of measurement is colony forming unit per per ml. Well, yeah, you're right now for for uh, for for total coliform and for total coliform and uh, E. coli is per one hundred per one hundred ml. Uh, sorry, no, it's really more for for. Uh, laboratory personnel to answer that, to answer that uh, uh, correctly. Sorry for that. But, but what I know, as I said, the, the HPC, the measure of, mas uh, the, measure of uh, the unit of measurement is called uh, colony forming unit per, per ml. Okay. So another question from Miss um, Agnes Aguilar. So she asks, can we still make use of the 16 parameters as basis before Oh, sorry, can we still make use of the 16 parameters as basis before rather than the 10 present that are said to be mandatory? Well, again, uh, before the 2007, we have about 14, 14 priority parameters. But this time for 2017, we have 10 uh, manda uh, mandatory parameters. So the basis for 10 is that based on, we based, uh, we based that, no, the list of mandatory parameters, we based on the experience, no? Uh, from 2007 to, to 2017, you know, based on the laboratory uh, results analysis from different laboratories, based on the experience of the uh, water service providers. You no, know, just that's, uh, that's, that's our basis you not know, to identify the list of parameters under the mandatory group. Um, as to as to question, they can still use you no. Know, but by but by again, no, that the mandatory parameters are just the minimum. So it will be the local government units, particularly the local health office, who will identify uh, from the mandatory additional parameters coming from the uh, primary parameters and secondary parameters. It's up to the local government units, no, up up to the local health office if they include additional parameters, no, uh, to their mandatory to the list of mandatory parameters. Of course, okay. the basis for additional are the, the activities happening. You know, if there's a possible source of that contaminants in that area, so the local government units uh, might include that parameters to be part of their mandatory parameters. Okay, so thank you for that answer, uh, Mr. Lito. So we have another another long question. So it uh, this question is from Joya. Yeah? So uh, we produce spring drinking water. We've encountered quality issues on our five-gallon containers. What is the specific reason of the off taste, off odor, and white flakes in our five-gallon containers? Is the chlorine residue contributing to the cause of white flakes in our drinking water? Well, my, um, I just want to be clarified if we're, uh, what is the source of their drinking water uh, uh, that they store in their container? Is it direct from the tap or it... Uh, the water is is the water a treated water? So supposed to be if it's a treated water, meaning coming from a water refilling station, supposed to be it doesn't have to contain a, um, a chlorine residual or any uh, uh, chem, chem, chemical residual. No, uh, but then if uh, if if they uh, if the water comes from the direct from the tap, no. So that could be one reason that the, that the presence of those white flakes are are, are due to to excess amount of chlorine no, in the distribution in the distribution taps. Okay, so the, uh, a potential cause is the um, amount of chlorine, as yeah. Mr. Lito said. Okay, so another question. So uh, these are the last three questions, Mr. Lito. So from Aries Constantino. So when do we need to conduct radiological tests? Is there a recommended thir third party testing center? Well, at this point in time, uh, the, uh, on, the, on the government side, um, the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute is the only agency you know, capable of doing radiological examination. Although I think uh, there's already a private, a private uh, laboratory like SGS, I think, uh, that's, cap that's capable of uh, testing, uh, testing radiological uh, examination. But based on the PNCW, uh, what we what we 
what we have adopted is that the testing should be done uh, based on the standards set by the uh, uh, Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Ari, so the f uh, for, t for radiological tests, the uh, Philippine Nuclear Research Institute uh, is the agency to go if you need some tests of that kind. So, In another question. I'm sorry. In terms of the when, when, when is it being required, no? So, well, the, uh, radiological is not part of the mandatory, but then, um, again, if the local government units or the local health office found no, that in their area there is a possible source of natural uh, radionuclides, no, they might require that no, to the service provider to test the water for radiolo radiological, ex uh, radiological examination. Again, the, the idea here is that the, the, the local government units or the local health office must apply risk assessment, no, identifying uh, priority parameters. So they have to look first, no, if there's a so possible source of that contaminants before they can include it in their additional parameters. Actually, you know, we were able to come up with the systems and procedures how to identify priority parameters, you no. Know? So is yeah, uh, and that procedures actually we use no risk assessment approach to identify priority parameters. Okay, thank you for that um, answer, Mr. Lito. So uh, second to the last question is from uh, Mr. Mark Kwan. So if the plant water source is deep well with their own filtration system, is it advisable to ask them to do third party testing twice a year, one during dry season and one another another one during rainy season? Well, if if the if the if a deep well is being used uh, exclusively for the household, no, actually it shall be the responsibility of the owner of the household to test his water, no, in terms of how, how frequent, no. But as to the standard, it should be done once every once every, in terms of microbiological, it should be done once every uh, once every uh, quarter. So so she has to practice self regulation, no. But uh, but the the. the if, it's, if the water is being used for, for private use, no, uh, but I, I like for if the water system is being used uh, uh, by the public, no, it shall be the responsibility of the local health office to, to ensure, no, that the service provider, the one who is managing the system, no, uh, uh, will comply with the requirements of the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water. Okay, so another question, uh, Mr. Lito, it comes from Miss Isa Ebora. So she asks, how do, you, how do sampling personnel get certified? Which certifying body regulates it? Okay. Um, actually, um, we have a draft, no? We have a draft administrative order uh, in relation to the acc accreditation of water sampler. And based on the draft uh, ad administrative order, the one who will conduct certification will be the National Reference Laboratory of the Department of Health. So the NRL actually they already uh, developed uh, a training a, a, a training module for water sampler certification. Actually, they already conducted a, a number of training you know, and already certified you know, uh, a number of water sampler, particularly uh, sanitary inspectors, you no, know, in, uh, in the in the local government units. So what we what we what what we what we miss na, right now is the 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 written policy, you know, but although the, the system is already in place, you no, know, with the National Reference Laboratory. Okay. So um, I hope Ms. Isa is taking note of this. The National Reference Laboratory is the sample, uh, certifying body. So I see that we still have a lot of questions, but uh, we'll try to entertain your questions uh, later since the time is used up. So uh, if there is nothing else, Mr. Lito, uh, we will wrap up your section of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lito. Okay. To keep the bowl rolling, uh, I will introduce our, our next speaker. So Ms. Din Fungo is a food safety expert and a registered chemical technician. She is a graduate of BS Food Technology at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. 
She has given talks in different conventions and universities and conducts food safety technical trainings and seminars to various food and feed manufacturing companies and government agencies nationwide, covering topics on GMP, sanitation and SOP, introduction to HACCP, hygiene and sanitation, and allergen awareness. Let us all welcome Ms. Dean Fungo. Thank you for that introduction, Ives. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're still okay over there. Okay, so before we proceed with the presentation, please allow me to introduce our company. Glenwood Technologies International Incorporated has been the provider of premium rapid diagnostic test kits since 1995 for both food and feed safety. Our product lines mainly cater to the testing of chemical hazards such as mycotoxins and allergens, microbiological hazards, monitoring of hygiene and sanitation, as well as our topic for today, water quality testing. Because of this, we have clients all along the food supply chain also including dietary supplement or nutraceutical industries, food service and retail establishments, as well as commercial and regulatory laboratories. Because of this, throughout the years, we have earned the trust of some of the world's largest companies, as well as the government agencies in our country. Then would also take pride in the technical support that we provide. We provide in-house technical trainings and seminars such as this one, as well as assistance and quality control programs. It is also the advocacy of Glenwood to promote food safety in the Philippines. We do this through the first and only Food Safety Trends PH magazine, which tackles food safety in the local setting. As Ives mentioned earlier, if you ask questions later on, you will have the chance to win the sixth issue on microbiology, the seventh issue on food safety in the supply chain, and the most recent issue on food allergen management. You can also follow us on our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Food Safety Trends PH. As of the moment, we have around 88,000 followers, most of which are food safety professionals. Now, without further ado, let's begin our topic for today on water quality testing solutions. Again, I am Odina Fungo from Glenwood. So I would like to begin this presentation by also summarizing a bit of what Engineer Lito has shared with us earlier. So I would like to emphasize that access to safe drinking water is not only essential for the promotion and protection of public health, but it is also our basic human right. It is our basic human right because when we have access to a safe water supply, the we are able to prevent our exposure to physical, chemical, and biological hazards. And preventing the transmission of these types of hazards also minimizes our risk of contracting waterborne diseases, namely bacterial infections such as cholera, leptospirosis, typhoid fever, parasitic infections such as ascariasis and gistosomiasis, and protozoal infections such as amebiasis. So because of this, of course, our drinking water has to be monitored and regulated. As mentioned by Engineer Lito earlier, we have standards for drinking water. And of course, the PNSDW has certain criteria that our drinking water has to conform to. Earlier, we saw the microbiological and chemical examinations, the corresponding standard values, as well as the evaluation of these results. Because these standards for drinking water establishes the threshold limits for different impurities that we find in drinking water. And as we mentioned earlier, this is intended to minimize risk and prevent serious health problems. As Engineer Lita also mentioned earlier, before the 2017 revision, the most recent version was from 2007. And since then, WHO published a 2011 updated guideline that addresses, that addresses issues on water quality. So the 2017 revision aimed to achieve all of these parameters inclusion in this revision. So the 2017 version is more comprehensive in terms of these parameters. Also, this revision advocates for an efficient water quality surveillance system, as mentioned by Engineer Lito earlier. This also includes the water safety plan included by the DOH from the 2014 administrative order. So this is to be reviewed by the DOH. Also, aside from the alignment with the WHO 
uh, guidelines from 2011, this specific revision also aligns with guidelines recommended by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency or the U.S. EPA. Engineer Dito also clarified the difference between these types of parameters. So let me just emphasize this once more for the sake of our discussion for today. So let's start with secondary parameters. So Sir Dito mentioned that these are operational parameters which affect treatment process efficiency, and these may render water unacceptable for drinking. When we talk about primary parameters, of course, aside from also indicating to us if our treatment process is efficient, these are specifically chemical impurities that directly affect health through exposure. And as Engineer Lito mentioned earlier, these may be site-specific, so it's, it's dependent on the local government unit if they will be enforcing this as also one of their mandatory parameters. Lastly, and most importantly, we have mandatory parameters. So as the name implies, these are required for all drinking water service providers, and they are legally enforceable. These are the parameters we, we um, consider as an indicator for general water supply quality. Also, based on previous monitoring data, these may have been parameters which have exceeded standards. And also, as Engineer Lito mentioned earlier, this may indicate the possible presence of other contaminants that we classify as primary or secondary parameters. So here again is the list of mandatory drinking water quality parameters. So we have 10 for the 2017 revision of the PNSDW. Let's begin our discussion with microbiological indicators under the mandatory parameters. This should be a review since Engineer Lito also mentioned this earlier. Let me ask if you were able to retain this information through our poll question number one. Okay, so as with our previous webinars, you just need to type your answer in the comment section after we give you a specific amount of time to answer. For our first poll question, According to Engineer Lito earlier, which of these serve as a definite evidence of fecal contamination? Is it A, total coliforms, or is it B, E. coli? Let us know in the comment section below. Okay, so I see that most of you answered correctly. The correct answer for this poll question is B, E. coli. Okay, so as mentioned by Engineer Lito earlier, E. coli is actually still a coliform. So what makes it the more definite evidence of fecal contamination? So let's further emphasize on this through this illustration. So total coliforms is a big group. So as mentioned earlier, uh, under total coliforms, we have fecal coliform, or the more updated version of referring to this group is actually thermotolerant coliform. Because if you would review the microbiological testing methods for these two groups, when you test for total coliform, the incubation time is uh, the incubation temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. While for these fecal coliforms, the incubation temperature is higher. So that's around 44.5 degrees Celsius. So that's the main distinction between these types of coliforms. Okay? But the presence of total coliforms, aside from being a potential uh, evidence of fecal contamination, it's also actually an indicator of general environmental contamination, and that includes soil. So of course, what we are looking for here is the presence of fecal matter. And in, if you would look at thermotolerant coliforms, most of the time, yes, they are present in fecal matter, but this 
this group, uh, this type of coliform is still not exclusively present in fecal matter compared to E. coli. So E. coli's natural reservoir is actually fecal matter. So this specific type of organism is what we are considering as definite evidence of fecal contamination. You may also be wondering, isn't it also dangerous if our water supply is contaminated with soil? Why is it uh, only considered um, mandatory for E. coli? Okay, so it's actually because fecal matter usually has pathogens. Okay, so there's a greater risk for fecal matter to contain pathogens compared to soil. Okay, so that is the main reason why, of course, we are considering this as a mandatory parameter because as we mentioned earlier, a definition of mandatory parameter is that these indicate the presence of other possible contaminants. So when we have a fecal contamination in our water supply, it's very much possible that we also have other pathogens. Okay, so this has been showed by Engineer Lito also earlier. So we see here the standard values, the detection methods, and the points of compliance for microbiological parameters. So first would be total coliforms. So we have the multiple tube fermentation technique, or the MTFT, the enzyme substrate test, or the EST, and the MFT, or the membrane filtration technique. So as Engineer Lito mentioned earlier, the Basically, the result that we want here is total coliform should be absent in our water sample. So after the incubation period of these tests, there should be no positive growth for total coliforms. The same goes for thermotolerant coliform or E. coli. If you would see here, we have MTFT, EST, and MFT as well. But if you would see the third column, we have additional steps to, of course, distinguish coliforms from thermotolerant coliform or E. coli. A most com one of the most common um, differences in terms of interpretation would be the observance, the observation of fluorescence at 366 nanometers. An example of the enzyme substrate test mentioned earlier under that table for microbiological indicators is Colitax. So this is a different selective differential medium, which enables us to obtain, obtain results for coliform and E. coli in as fast as 16 hours. Colitag is a one-step, ready-to-use chromogenic enzyme substrate test that is both selective and differential in the sense that it is selective so that other microorganisms do not grow during this incubation period and it differentiates the results of coliforms and E. coli that we observe in as fast as 16 hours. Colitag also has the patented proton gradient resuscitation technology, which resuscitates chlorine injured cells. And because of this feature, sensitivity of Colitag is one chlorine injured coliform per 100 ml water sample. Colitag is also approved by the US EPA and has also been validated by the DOH National Reference Laboratory. So, how does Colitag work specifically? So, we just need to add the Colitag media to our 100 ml water sample, perform the incubation for 16 to 48 hours at 35 degrees Celsius. Then we need to visually check the sample for yellow color for coliforms. And then if we have a positive result for coliforms, we subject our sample to UV light at 366 nanometers. So we observe for fluorescence. If ever that the sample exhibits fluorescence as well, then our sample is positive for E. coli. So again, this is a more clear interpretation of the results. So if our sample is negative for coliforms, we see that there is no yellow coloration. While for a positive result for coliforms, we see a, a clear and bright yellow color. For a positive result for E. coli, we see fluorescence under long weight UV light. Okay, so this is for the presence or absence testing, but actually Colitag can also be used to obtain quantitative results. If you would remember earlier, we have there the multiple tube fermentation technique. You can actually use Colitag there as a substitute medium. But aside from that, you can also use the MPN plate. The MPN plate is a modern approach to the traditional MPN method. So it actually uses the same procedure for Colitag, except that incubation is done in the MPN plate instead of the sample container that we showed earlier. So here, you will just need to transfer your sample containing the Colitag media to the MPN plate, which consists of five 10 ml wells, five 1 ml wells, 
5.1 ml wells and 16th well to collect the remaining sample. After the incubation period, you will just need to count all positive wells. So how many wells turn positive under 10 ml, so on and so forth. Okay, so after that, counting the positive wells which exhibited yellow color, which exhibited fluorescence, you will just need to refer to this MPN plate for the results in MPN per 100 ml. So in a similar way, as you mentioned earlier, we still need to observe no positive wells under this method for us to pass the mandatory and microbiological indicator standards under the PNSDW. The third microbiological indicator that we also tackled earlier with Engineer Lito is heterotrophic plate count, or HPC, which is monitored at less than 500 CFU per ml. As mentioned by Sir Lito earlier, the presence of heterotrophic plate count also affects the quality of water. This may also indicate the presence of high bacterial levels and other pathogens, and also may indicate that the water treatment is ineffective. A rapid testing solution for heterotrophic plate count is compact dry. So compact dry is a ready-to-use chromogenic plate, which enables us not to sterilize anymore our media before use, because again, this is ready to use, and also the sample automatically diffuses in the fabric. So after dispensing, we do not need to use spreaders and other accessories. So again, heterotrophic plate count tests for microorganisms which require high amounts of organic carbon for growth. So these are microorganisms which usually reside in water. For the direct procedure for compact dry, we need to obtain 100 ml water sample. From there, dispense 1 ml of the water sample on the middle of the plate, then incubate at 36 degrees Celsius for 44 hours. We can also follow the ISO 6222 incubation time and temperature at 22 degrees Celsius for 68 hours. And after that, we just need to read the results. For the membrane filtration procedure, we can perform the usual procedure and then transfer filter to the hydrated plate, meaning we just need to add 1 ml of sterile water before we put the filter to the hydrated compact dry plate. Then the incubation is, according to SMU as well, incubate at 35 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. Then we read results by interpreting the, all the red and otherwise colored colonies as positive for heterotrophic plate count. Another testing solution is an AOAC of official method of analysis, isogrid and neogrid. This is also approved by the Canadian Standard Methods for the examination of water and wastewater. Isogrid and neogrid have a hydrophobic 1600 grid. So what is the main advantages of having this hydrophobic grid? This hydrophobic grid is able to contain the growth of a colony within one square. This minimizes spreading and also enhances contrast and visibility of the colonies that is grown on these membrane filters. The, ones, the 1600 grid is also very useful for statistical reproducibility. This broad counting range actually spans greater than three dilutions, eliminating the need for duplicate plating and also for dilutions. To summarize the process, first we just need to put the isogrid membrane filter into the filtration unit. After applying this setup, we just need to put the sample inside the filtration unit. It will pass through a pre-filter and then towards the membrane filter we, where we will be able to retain the target organism. The NeoGrid also employs a similar procedure except that here, NeoGrid uses a disposable filtration unit. IsoGrid uses a sterilizable filtration unit that can be reused after decontamination. Also, you have to note here that the membrane filter for NeoGrid is already placed inside the filtration unit. But in general, for both IsoGrid and NeoGrid, after the filtration process, the IsoGrid or NeoGrid membrane filter is removed and placed onto the agar plate for incubation. So after this, we just need to count the number of positive squares and then we will obtain results in MPN per 100 ml of our sample. Another rapid testing solution is the Neogen filter and ampule media. 
So this is actually developed by the US EPA as well and has been recommended for use by the American Public Health Association. So uh, this system also makes use of membrane filters, 0.45 micron membrane filters, and 2 ml ampule media. If you would see the filtration units, this filtration unit can actually also be converted to a petri dish after removing the plastic funnel after the filtration process. So this is the overview of the Neogen filter and ampule media setup. So after the filtration process, you will just need to add the ampule media, the 2ml ampule media inside the funnel. Then after applying a brief amount of vacuum in order to soak the membrane filter correctly, you will remove the plastic funnel and then convert that unit to a petri dish. And after that, you can incubate according to the recommended incubation period type of broth that has been used. Okay, so now that we have discussed the different microbiological indicators, now it's time to discuss the remaining mandatory parameters. So what for this, that this brings us to our second poll question. According to the WHO, what is the most significant chemical contaminant in drinking water? Is it one, chlorine? Is it lead, arsenic, cadmium, or nitrates? Let us know in the comment section below. Okay, so I see mixed answers. The correct answer for this poll question is actually arsenic. Okay, so let's expound more on this. Why is arsenic considered as the most significant chemical contaminant in drinking water globally? First and foremost, arsenic is highly toxic. It may be present at high levels in groundwater. So I'll elaborate why is it actually present at high levels in groundwater later on. So from, the, from these slides, you will also see the word MAL. So this is the maximum allowable limit according to the PNSDW. So for arsenic, the maximum allowable limit is 0 0.01 milligrams per liter or 0 0.01 ppm or 10 ppb. Arsenic has been associated with skin cancer and lesions. It's actually considered as a carcinogenic for humans. But to be specific, why is arsenic actually a problem in drinking water? So the data here may be too small for you to see, so I'll just expound on certain points. First and foremost, the main source of arsenic in drinking water is usually when arsenic-rich rocks, through, uh, is through arsenic-rich rocks through which the water has been filtered. Okay? And if you would look at the data here, as I mentioned earlier, this arsenic is a carcinogenic for humans. It has been acknowledged by the US EPA as well as a carcinogenic. The numbers here, if you would see, 130 million is the amount of people across the world exposed to levels of arsenic in drinking water that exceed the 10 ppb limit. How about the 50 million? These are the amount of people that have been exposed to arsenic levels exceeding five times this recommended limit. How about the 90% here? The 90% here in this diagram is actually the amount of people known to have had high water arsenic exposure in Asia. Okay, so these, this is just a summary of why arsenic is very toxic and dangerous in drinking water. How about cadmium? Cadmium is an indicator of industrial waste and fertilizer contamination, but another prominent contaminant source is the corrosion of galvanized pipes, which usually have 
maybe cadmium solders, or maybe have an impurity in the zinc that was used. Also, this cadmium is very toxic because this may cause kidney, liver, bone, and blood damage. Cadmium is regulated by the PNSDW at 0 0.003 ppm or 3 ppb. The next mandatory parameter is lead, which is actually from corroded plumbing materials, usually associated with older, uh, older houses making use of lead service lines. What is concerning about lead is it can actually bioaccumulate in the body, and younger children are more vulnerable to its effects. In the U.S., actually, there has been a lead and copper rule, which aims to actually control the corrosivity of the water. The maximum allowable limit for lead is 0 0.01 milligrams per liter, or 10 ppb. Next, we have nitrates. So this may be caused by flood water contamination, the overuse of chemical fertilizers, or improper well construction, well location, and waste disposal. Also, like arsenic, Nitrates cannot actually be addressed by heating and chlorination. Also, if you heat a certain water sample with nitrates, you can actually increase the concentration of nitrates because of the evaporation of water. Nitrates can only be removed by processes such as reverse osmosis, distillation, and ion exchange. The maximum allowable limit for nitrates is at 50 ppm. But what is actually concerning about nitrates? Nitrates is actually associated with reducing the ability of red blood cells to carry oxygen. And with children and adults, this ability or this effect of nitrates, they, it can return rapidly. Okay? Um, so we are able to adapt to this effect on, of nitrates on our body. But this is not the case for infants. So if ever the infants are actually fed with, bo uh, bottle fed with water, or maybe they eat certain food with, made with water with high amounts of nitrates, they may actually encounter or have problems with the blue baby syndrome because of the lack of oxygen. The next mandatory parameter is apparent color. So this is actually monitored at 10 color units or 10 CU. So Engineer Lee Talk actually expounded a lot on this matter. So we have um, the reason because of the, the, uh, the apparent color being altered may be because of colloidal matter, suspended particulates. So this is actually true. But maybe we have also encountered the term true color. So what is the difference actually between true color and apparent, apparent color? When we talk about true color, this is measured with turbidity removed by filtration or centrifugation. So true color is most often caused by dissolved compounds. On the other hand, what is monitored or regulated in a PNSDW is apparent color. This is measured without turbidity removed. So unlike true color that is only caused by dissolved compounds, when we talk about apparent color, this includes both dissolved and suspended solids. Okay? Because turbidity in the form of these colloidal matter or suspended particulates can scatter light transmitted through liquids. And this action alters the observed color for the human eyes. Next that we have seen for the mandatory parameters would be turbidity. Turbidity reduces the clarity of water and also increases the intensity of scattered light. So to the human eye, we may see that water becomes cloudy or opaque, as you can see here in the illustration. So we have here from 0 0.05 NTU, so the unit for turbidity is nephilometric turbidity units, while for color earlier, the unit is color units. If you would see here in the illustration, as you go from 0 0.05 NTU, to 800 NTU, the water has become cloudier or opaque. So here with turbidity, for turbidity, and uh, other, rather, for turbidity, the PNSDW regulates this at 5 NTU, or 5 nephilometric turbidity units. How about pH? Why is monitoring the pH of water considered a mandatory parameter? The pH of water actually determines the solubility and biological availability of chemical constituents such as nutrients and metals. So this has a very significant effect on corrosivity. So for example, if the water pH is very low, chances are metals become more toxic because metals are more soluble at acidic pH. pH also affects disinfection efficiency, particularly if you are using chlorine, the pH should be lower than 8 to 
to ensure that chlorine is uh, minimally affected by pH. So for reference, here is an illustration of the different pH of common drinks. So of course, you have sparkling water at 3 to 4, bottled alkaline water at 8.5 to 12. But when we are talking about bottled or tap water, the limit or the maximum allowable limit, according to the PNSDW, is 6.5 to 8.5, while for, for refilling stations and vending machines, it's around 5 to 7. Next, we have total dissolved solids, or TDS. So this refers to the inorganic salts and small amounts of organic matter, which may affect water taste and palatability. So actually, under these total dissolved solids, we have carbonates, we also have salts. When we have carbonates in our water, this can cause a certain bitter taste and can also affect water hardness in general. So this is what we associate with the scaling of water pipes. On the other hand, when we have salts in our water, this of course has a certain salty taste, so chlorides, and also this affects the corrosivity of water. So according to the PNSDW, the maximum allowable limit for water is 600 ppm. But take note, as mentioned as well by Engineer Lito earlier, if the water is from refilling stations, vending machines, which have undergone reverse osmosis and distillation, the maximum allowable limit is at 10 ppm to ensure that the process was effective. Okay, so before we discuss the last mandatory parameter, I will have you answer this third poll question. I think this, uh, this is actually very familiar. I've seen the term earlier during the questions to Engineer Lito. So I hope we answer this correctly. Which of these types of chlorine are available for disinfection? Is it A, chlorine demand? Is it B, combined chlorine? Or is it C, free chlorine? Let us know in the comment section below. Okay, so I see that most of you have the correct answer. The answer to this poll question is free chlorine. But of course, let's differentiate the different types of chlorine that we are talking about. When we disinfect our water sample, we have, of course, the chlorine added. This is the initial concentration of chlorine that we add. But after a certain period of time, prior to disinfection, our water sample would have a certain chlorine demand, meaning this is the amount of chlorine which reacts with organic and inorganic material, metals, and other compounds in water. And after that, we have a certain percentage of the chlorine we added remaining after this chlorine demand is met, and that is what we call total chlorine. From this point, total chlorine will form up the sum between free chlorine and combined chlorine. When we talk about combined chlorine, this is the concentration combined with organic and inorganic nitrogen compounds forming chloramines. This is usually um, a product of reaction with microorganisms. So this combined chlorine is not available for disinfection. However, we have the free chlorine, and this is actually what we term as residual chlorine in the PNSDW, and this is the concentration of chlorine available for disinfection. Let's visualize this a bit more. When we talk about total chlorine again, it's the sum between free and combined chlorine. Initially, of course, you have a fixed chlorine demand because this occurs prior to disinfection. You have a certain amount of free chlorine as you see here, but after a period of time, 
this free chlorine decreases and the combined chlorine increases because during storage, of course, your sample becomes exposed to microorganisms. And that is why we need residual chlorine or residual disinfectant in general during our storage because we do not want our water to be recontaminated. Okay? So to emphasize, the presence of residual disinfectant in our water sample prevents water recontamination during storage after the water treatment process. But of course, as this is a disinfectant, these should be present in a safe amount for humans, specifically for free chlorine for bulk water supply. As Engineer Lito also mentioned earlier, the MAL is 0.3 to 1.5 ppm, while for residual chlorine dioxide, it's 0.2 to 0.4 ppm. So for all of these chemical parameters that we discussed, the most practical or the economical way to test these would actually be through semi-quantitative test strips or quantitative test strips, using also as well photometers for quantitative results. First, we have the industrial test system test strips, which operate on the principle between the embedded reagents on the test strip reacting with the target chemicals from the water sample. So we have different types of test strips. So this ranges as well from the mandatory up to the secondary parameters that was discussed earlier. We also have US EPA compliant parameters. So the free chlorine, total chlorine strips, which are, which are based on the DPD method. And we also have chlorine dioxide, sulfate, the coliform and E. coli presence or absence test strips. Specifically, we have the SenseSafe test strip line, which have test strips based on standard chemical methods. The most unique feature of the SenseSafe test strips would be the patented aperture design. As you can see in the illustration, with the aperture test strip, the water sample can pass back and forth from the test strip. Because of this, the test strip has 50 times more sensitivity than a normal test strip. Also, we have US EPA compliant parameters under this specific product line. You also have the Waterworks semi-quantitative strip format test. So again, these test strips are based on standard chemical methods. It has US EPA compliant parameters, and these actually have single or dual pads. You can test multiple parameters using a test strip. The general procedure for the SenseSafe and Waterworks test strips are summarized into three. First, you just need to dip, then you need to shake the test strip, and also Afterwards, just read the sample. Depending on the parameter, results can be obtained in less than one minute. You just need to compare the color of the test pad with the chart provided in the kit. And also, these test strips can also be disposed easily by throwing away in the trash. We also have US EPA ETV verified strips. So we have U the US EP Environmental Technology Verification Program, which has a public-private partnership with EPA. Specifically for these, we have the arsenic and cyanide product lines. So for arsenic, this is the quick product, which is a wide array of rapid inorganic arsenic test kits for easy in-lab or on-field analysis. Using this product, results can be obtained in as fast as for 14 seconds. And as I mentioned earlier, the performance and accuracy has also been verified by the US EPA through the ETV program. We also have quantitative products. So here we make use of test strips and photometers to generate quantitative results. The first product is Clarine Exact Easy. So this has nine installed tests. As you can see here, it's also EPA Health Department compliant. It has an IP67 waterproof rating, meaning that these meters or these photometers can be submerged to a depth of water of one meter for around 30 minutes. Also, this has wireless connectivity via Bluetooth Smart and can be operated with the Exact iDip app. The Clarine Exact Easy system is also NSF certified. You also have the Exact Micro 20 Smart Photometer System with 40 installed tests. So unlike the Clarine Exact Easy earlier, which has one wavelength, here we can test for parameters requiring not only 525 nanometers, but also 638 nanometers. It also has similar features with the Clarine Exact Easy. Namely, it's also IP67 
It's also Bluetooth smart. And also, it uses the same strips as the Clarine Exact Easy, so it also has the EPA compliant parameters. For these specific systems, the main principle is the colorimetric detection of target ions in water samples. As I mentioned earlier, this is a portable water resistant photometer for fast on site quantitative testing. The general procedure for exact photometers, you just need to fill the cell with 4 ml of your water sample, then dip the strip. After that, read the results. So unlike earlier with the SenseSafe and Waterworks products, wherein we compare the color of the pad with a, the with a chart on the bottle of the test strips, here there is a specific color reaction changing the color of the water sample after a certain period of time. So here the results are read by the photometer and we are able to obtain quantitative results. This is also the overview of the Exact IDIP app. So this is what we mentioned earlier regarding wireless connectivity. So here we can actually store our results as well. So let's, let's summarize what we have learned today. So again, we have microbiological indicators, namely total coliforms, thermotolerant coliforms, and E. coli. We also have heterotrophic plate count. Under the mandatory drinking water quality parameters, we discussed each of these chemical parameters as well. Aside from leaving you with our company slogan, food safety is both a right and a responsibility, I would also like to emphasize after our discussion today that quality water is safe water. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dean, for that talk on solutions for water quality testing. Uh, we are now going to take questions for Ms. Dean. Excuse me. Just a reminder, please type your questions into the comment section. Also, due to time constraints, we will only be accommodating a couple of questions. So we have a question, Ms. Din, from uh, Joanna Matic. So she asks, is it possible that the sample is positive in Colitag, but without count in HPC? Well, uh, technically, that would not be possible because, as you mentioned, um, heterotrophic plate count measures the total count of bacteria in a water sample and coliforms are still considered part of that plate count. So of course, if you have a positive result, for example, for colitag, that means you have certain microorganisms in your sample and therefore you should also have a positive result for their trophic plate count. But of course, we can't, we can't identify the specific number because the... Okay. The heterotrophic plate count is actually an indicator for a general type of microorganisms, okay? So we can correlate. For example, if using Colitag, you had the MPN plate, you obtained quantity, then that does not necessarily mean that you will have the same amount of coliform, uh, the same amount of microorganisms in the heterotrophic plate count. Okay, thank you for that uh, for that answer, Ms. Dean. Uh, we have another concern. So uh, they say, our water is reacting to chlorine content. This chloration is very evident in our water. In case we don't meet the permissible level of chlorine residual, uh, what can be done to at least meet the minimum standards for chlorine without sacrificing the quality of our water? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the uh, question? <laughs> okay, I'll repeat the question. Uh, so in case we don't meet the permissible level of chlorine residual, what can be done to at least meet, meet the minimum standards for chlorine without sacrificing the quality of our water? Well, uh, I think the question is sort of fake, but definitely I would recommend that since we have a certain range for chlorine, let's say the 0.3 to 1.5 ppm, we, sh we should always stick to that allowable range. Okay, so the, this range has been specified by the PNSDW to minimize as well the effect of chlorine in terms of its toxicity to humans, but while also maintaining the necessary residual concentration to prevent water recontamination. So I will still suggest that we go between the allowable range for chlorine. Okay. So another question, Ms. Din, um, can you consider below 0.3 ppm of residual chlorine, chlorine of drinking water if the microbiological results are within the standard limit? 
no, uh, I still, I will still stick with my answer earlier. We should still at least have 0.3 ppm of free chlorine in our sample because as I also illustrated earlier, after a certain period of time, that free chlorine will decrease. Okay, so we have to ensure that even if there is a certain amount of microorganisms that our water sample is exposed to, we are not compromising our water sample. Okay, so maybe at the point of testing, you have uh, satisfactory microbiological results. But during storage, because you did not uh, follow the PNSDW standard, it's possible that your water will no longer be safe. So this is the very important thing we have to remember when it comes to chlorination as well. Okay, thank you for that um, answer, Ms. Dean. Um, we have one last question. Uh, one last question. So, uh, what will be the ideal holding time of water to be analyzed? Well, actually, it will be depending on the specific parameter that you will be testing. So, some parameters, if actually it's very detailed in the PNSDW per parameter, they spe they specify the holding time. Okay, so some parameters will require just testing after a few hours, while some parameters maybe you can um, give in proper storage conditions and using the proper holding container. Sometimes they specify the glass containers or maybe polyethylene containers and the like. So given those other factors, then you can store the sample or hold the sample before testing for maybe a few days. But again, it would depend on the specific parameter that you will be testing. Okay, so... Um Ms. Dean, we have uh, other questions uh, to be asked. So another question is, what would you suggest if this is the result? Positive, uh, uh, hang on, that, that was already asked. Oh, so, so we have another question. Does pH level of the water affect the result in microbiological testing? What are the possible causes that would give a false positive result? Uh, well, it depends on what specific test method you are using. <clears throat> okay, so for example, if you are using, just an example, for example, if you are using isogrid to test your water sample, then you do not have to worry about the effect of pH. Okay, um, so uh, the next question I think would be if you, you will have false positive results false positive. because of pH. Well, again, it would depend on the test method, but in general, when you use, um, when you test for microorganisms or when you use a microbiological test method, the pH range should be close to neutral to ensure that you are not contributing any source of interference to the type of test method that you are using. Okay, thank you for that, for answering that last question, Ms. Din. Uh, so if there's anything else, uh, we would proceed now to the announcement of winners. So just a reminder, uh, the speaker's PPD presentations are properties of Glenwood Technologies and the DOH Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, and they will not be shared with the participants. You could still, however, send an email directly to our speakers if you have any clarifications or questions. So as announced at the start of the webinar, we will be giving away free copies of the Food Safety Trends PH magazine to the attendees who send questions. So our representatives have now randomly selected three lucky participants. Congratulations to Lara Pretzella Tienza, John Amatic, and Des Bechaida. To all the winners, please send your contact information, like your address and mobile number, to yvesnaputo at glenwood.ph. Congratulations to the winners. If you wish to get a copy of the magazine, you could subscribe by sending us an email at foodsafetytrendsph at gmail.com. You could also be a part of the largest online community of food safety professionals in the Philippines. Follow the Facebook page of Food Safety Trends PH. Just type facebook.com forward slash food safety trends PH. Thank you for joining our Facebook group. If you know someone who could be a great addition to this group, please do not hesitate to invite them to interact and engage with our local and international food safety experts. We appreciate you being here with us virtually. If you have other questions or messages for Mr. Lito and Ms. Din, 
you could email them at literiego at yahoo.com and dinfungo at glenwood.ph. To those interested for Glenwood's water testing solutions and know how we can help your institution employ an effective hygiene and sanitation control program, send us an email at gdi-info at glenwood.ph or visit our website at glenwood.ph. Please completely fill out the feedback form as a requirement to, our, to your electronic copy of Certificate of Participation. The link will be provided in the comments section after the webinar. The electronic Certificate of Participation will be sent to the attendee's registered email address a month after this session. Again, thank you for joining us today and we will see you next time.